So we've decided that you do need government to regulate pollution. So then the question is, how should the government regulate pollution? <clears throat> so these are various topics which are taken from Chapter 10, but not really in the order that your authors present them. The first that I wanted to talk about is the polluter pays principle. And you might think of this as simply being in, in a kind of Kosian framework, the uh, property rights being assigned to the pollution victims. Now I wanted to, uh, to, to pull up Wikipedia's discussion of the polluter pays principle. Just a moment. Here we go. And so what Wikipedia says is, in environmental law, the polluter pays principle is enacted to make the party responsible for producing pollution responsible for paying the damage done to the natural environment. It is regarded as a regional custom because of the strong support it has received in most OECD and European Union countries. It is a fundamental principle of U.S. environmental law. Well, uh, is it really? On so the, the Wikipedia article has a long discussion of the history of the polluter pays principle. Uh, it go, um, goes back to um, uh, maybe the, the 19th century. Um, you know, the European Union um, set it out in 2004. And it even claims that the United States has employed in all the major U.S. pollution control laws, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, uh, the Superfund Act. Um, let me just say, well, as Wikipedia also says, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has observed that the polluter pays principle has typically not been fully implemented in U.S. laws and programs. And that's true in Europe as well. Um, European governments have interpreted the polluter pays principle as being completely consistent with giving polluters subsidies to buy pollution control equipment. And I, I don't see logically how how those things can be compatible. And if you're giving the polluter taxpayer money so that the polluter can buy equipment that diminishes pollution, how is that consistent with the polluter pays? I mean, yes, the polluter is literally buying the equipment. So in that sense, the polluter is paying to buy the pollution control equipment. But you've given the money to the polluter to do it. Uh, similarly, in the United States, uh, well, for example, in southern Louisiana, the marshland is crisscrossed by canals dug often decades ago to service now completely defunct oil wells or gas wells. The oil companies have never been under any kind of legal obligation to put those canals, to, to remove those canals. That is to put the land, the marshland back into its natural condition. And that has caused seawater to, to travel up through these canals, which kills the aquatic plants, which means that there's nothing, the plant roots don't hold the soil anymore. So the soil collapses and essentially wetlands are being lost uh, multiple acre multiple i think i don't know whether it's dozens or hundreds of acres every day uh, to to the ocean D there's a requirement e either when those canals were dug or even right now for the oil companies to restore that natural environment so maybe the polluter pays principle is is uh invoked in some sense in the U.S. and Europe, but it's certainly not a, a fundamental principle that that affects every single pollution problem, not, not by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, so I'm going to go back. So I think what we can say about the polluter pays principle is that it reflects some of what happens legally in the U.S., in the European Union, and other countries, but certainly not everything. So that's, you know, we're discussing methods of government regulation. 
Okay, so that's the polluter pays principle. The next one that the book talks about is the precautionary principle. Now, Wikipedia also has a has an entry on that, but I think it's easier to discuss it the way I, I'm going to hear on this screen. Let x be the probability that, I, that an activity will cause harm. Or maybe you want to say that an activity will cause great harm. These the precautionary principle is not really precise and I'm, I'm trying to make it as clear as I can. So there's some vagueness here whether it's any harm at all or a lot of harm. We're just going to leave that vague. There's a weak form of the precautionary principle and a strong form of the precautionary principle. The weak form of the precautionary principle says that governments should follow the following rule, should use the following rule. Prohibit an activity only if x is equal to 1. Now remember, x is the probability that an activity will cause harm. x is equal to 1, saying that you're completely sure, you're positive, that the activity will cause harm. So the weak form of the precautionary principle says, prohibit only if you're sure that the activity will cause harm. All right, I had something wrong, so I just fixed it. Let me read it again. So the weak form says that you should not oops, you should not adopt the following rule. Government should not adopt the following rule. The rule is prohibit only if x is equal to 1. Okay, so this rule, what's in quotations, says only prohibit if you are 100% sure, that's what x equals 1 mean, a means, 100% sure that the activity is going to cause harm. And the weak form of the precautionary principle says you shouldn't adopt such a policy. Okay. Example. Don't adopt the following policy. Quote, prohibit carbon emissions only if all scientists and politicians are 100% sure that carbon emissions are bad. So what's in quotes is saying um, the government should prohibit something only if there's no doubt at all on the part of anybody that it's bad. So if everybody agrees that it's bad, then it's okay for the government to, to prohibit it. But if even one person thinks it might not be bad, the government shouldn't prohibit it. And the weak form of the precautionary principle is saying, do not adopt that policy. I know this is a little hard to understand because it's always hard to understand a definition which is framed in terms of the word not. Um, but this is, I think, the clearest I can I can make it. The weak form says, don't, do not adopt the policy of allowing everything unless people are 100% sure. All people are 100% sure that it's bad. Now, the, uh, the problem with the weak form is that it may be a straw man. A straw man argument means arguing against a position that nobody really has. So a straw man is not a real man. It's just a man made of straw. So nobody really, it's not nobody really has such an opinion is there anybody who really suggests that what government that the rule that government should use is this rule is there anybody that really suggests government can't do anything unless every single person is a hundred percent sure that such a thing is bad and then then government can regulate it I'm rather sympathetic with the notion that this is a straw man. I, I think even, let's say, economic conservatives, politi political conservatives, wouldn't go so far as to say that the only situation under which you should, an uh, only uh, situation under which it's legitimate for the government to control greenhouse gas emissions is if every single person in the whole society, including 
the leaders of the fossil fuel industry agree that the government should do that. I, 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 I yeah, I, I think that's probably a, a straw man argument. All right, now let's turn to the strong form of the precautionary principle. The strong form of the precautionary principle says government should follow the following rule. Prohibit if x is greater than 0. Now remember, x is the probability that the activity will cause harm. Saying that x is, is greater than 0 means there's some probability that it's going to cause harm. And there may be a 50% probability that it causes harm. There may be a 1% probability that it causes harm. There might be a 0.001% probability that it causes harm. S that is, prohibit unless there's complete certainty that the activity is safe. Now, this has its own practical problems. And the Wikipedia article actually um, talks about this. Let's think about uh, global warming. You could use the strong farm to argue in the following way. I, I don't think, quote, I don't think we should take any actions to alleviate global warming because global warming, uh, because taking such actions might be bad. If you take such an action, the action might be successful, civilization might be saved, human civilization might be saved, and once human civilization is saved because we've fixed the problem of global warming, humans might decide, or some human might decide to launch a nuclear war and a global nuclear holocaust occurs and all life on Earth is uh, uh, goes extinct. So that might be the result of alleviating climate change. Whereas if you allow climate change to occur, maybe humans will go extinct. And if humans go extinct, then they, they can't launch a nuclear war. And so the rest of life on Earth will survive. So since there's a chance, not a high chance, but a chance that saving humanity might be a bad thing, we shouldn't try to save humanity. Unquote. You see, I think, the problem with this strong form. In fact, the strong form could argue both that so I just gave an argument, according to the strong form, that we shouldn't try to alleviate global warming. But you can also give an argument using the strong form that you should try to alleviate global warming. Um, you know, th there's even a, an argument that the strong form is self-contradictory. Um, the strong form says you shouldn't do something unless you know 100% sure that it's safe. How do we know that using the precautionary, the strong form of the precautionary principle is 100% sure that it's safe? Maybe using the strong form of the precautionary principle has a danger. But if using the strong form of the precautionary principle has a danger, then according to the strong form of the precautionary principle, we shouldn't use the strong form of the precautionary principle. All right. Um, so that's to show that while there's a lot of discussion of the precautionary principle, especially in Europe, it's not clear that the precautionary principle, if you think through it very carefully and rigorously, makes a lot of sense. Here's the Wikipedia article on the precautionary principle. Um, to, critics argue that it is vague, self-canceling, unscientific, and an obstacle to progress. Um, it emphasizes caution, pausing and review before leaping into new innovations that may prove disastrous. Uh, Wikipedia suggests 
it was it may date back to 1729 in civil engineering uh, you, you know civil engineers have to wonder about how strong should you design a bridge strong enough so that it will not collapse under typical conditions under unusual conditions strong enough so that it's like t twice as strong as unusual conditions four times as strong as unusual conditions i mean how strong should you make a bridge or a building so so civil engineers have to wonder about the margin of uh, margin of error factors of safety and the wikipedia article goes into international agreements and declarations of the EU, France, the US, Australia, the Philippines, uh, corporations. Um, there's a distinction between the, the precautionary principle and the precautionary approach. The precautionary approach is looser and not exact. The precautionary principle is more strict. But then you get these criticisms, internal inconsistency, blocking innovation, vagueness and plausibility and the last one the precautionary dilemma about w w what i said a little while ago that the precautionary principle might mean that you can't use the precautionary principle so the the origin here is there isn't an english from the translation of a german term uh, forzoga princip that um that you should ban certain that banning the use of certain substances suspected in causing the environmental damage even though the evidence of their impact was inconclusive so i'm going to flip to the other screen now i i, I think that the the weak form maybe not exactly the weak form of the precautionary principle but something along the lines of the weak form of the precautionary principle is useful uh it it uh, it is useful to argue against people who say we need to be totally certain about things before we take any action it is useful to argue against people who say that in the absence of complete certainty government can't do anything so that's i i think a useful contribution i'm not sure that the precautionary principle in practice is is useful beyond that all right, so we talked about the precautionary, uh, the polluter pays principle, the precautionary principle, um, broad regulatory approaches, and this is going to be our uh, what we we're talking about a lot in the next few chapters. There are two broad categories of regulatory approaches: command and control and economic incentives. So, command and control means that if, for example, the socially optimal level of pollution is q star and that's less than q pi which is where firms want to go you just pass a law saying that producing more than q star is illegal that doesn't have anything to do with economics that's just a prohibition it's a command thou shalt not produce more than q star units of output in order to control pollution so command and control uh, example if you take your automobile in to get it to get a smog inspection done there's a certain limit of pollution that your car can emit and if it's above that it's illegal you can't drive it you have to get it fixed uh i mean you can't drive it in the long run you can drive it in the short run to get it fixed and if it's below that then it's fine so that's command and control the the other so that's command and control. The other is using economic incentives like taxes, subsidies, tradable permits, marketable quotas. Now, taxes and subsidies are kind of, you're, everybody's familiar with taxes. Subsidies are just the opposite of taxes. Tradable permits, and by the way, there are two perfectly good ways of spelling the word tradable. Uh, one that has an E in it and one that doesn't have an E in it. Um, and, and I may sometimes go back and forth between one and the other, but... And and apparently I looked it up. This is not a distinction between British usage and American usage. It's just that some English speakers spell it with an E and some don't. So we'll discuss tradable permits and marketable uh, quotas, which are this more or less the same thing in in a future chapter. But these are things that 
don't have a legal prohibition. Instead, uh, the way taxes would work, you want to you want to pollute. Okay, you can pollute as much as you want, but you got to pay a tax on every single unit of pollution. Or we give you a subsidy if you don't pollute, or if you buy polluting re, uh, reducing pollution reducing reducing equipment. Um, and tradable permits and marketable quotas, as I said, we'll get into the details later, but um, let's see, there is a, um, with, with taxes, there's the carbon taxes that's uh, popular in the political discussion these days. Um, tradable permits, the, the, the political term is cap and trade, so cap and trade policies. So these are the two regulatory approaches that we're going to contrast in the coming chapters. Command and control is the one that historically has been used most commonly. That's why we use command and control for smog regulation, pollution regulation of automobiles in, in Salt Lake City. Using economic incentives, this is uh, newer Lots of these ideas came about because economists have advocated them. So, so these are so economic incentives are newer and they're not used nearly as much, but they're coming to be increasingly used as as the decades go on. And we are going to talk more about economic incentive instruments in the next chapter, chapter 11. So I think that's where I'm going to stop this video.